Let's implement the band limited pulse generator and we will essentially be coming up with a LabVIEW implementation of the truncated Fourier series that I have pictured in the upper right. One of the parameters for this truncated Fourier series is the maximum number of sinusoidal components, and that's n, and I also need my fundamental frequency in hertz, f0. I will then place my remaining front panel indicators or front panel controls, excuse me, and that would be duration of the signal and the sampling frequency. Now I've set the representation for my value n to an integer since our devices later on will be expecting an, an integer number of samples. I'll place the device called tones and noise from the signal processing palette. Just do a quick check of the various connecting terminals on this sub-VI. You have quite a bit of options. I will only be using a few of those for the band limited pulse generator. Let me begin by first calculating the total number of samples that we need to generate. What I'll do is form the product of the duration of the signal and the sampling frequency. Sampling frequency is samples per second. and when, when we multiply that by duration, we have samples. Again, I will convert this to integer representation before I use it further. And that way we avoid having the coercion dots appear on the inputs of terminals that are looking for an integer. Now let me look at the detailed help just to get a better feel for what's required for tones. This is a um, cluster and uh, you can look at this in detail and essentially see that you can specify the frequency, the amplitude, and the phase of each one of your sinusoidal components. In order to make a cluster we use the bundle node. Notice that we cannot actually create uh, or that's I was looking for the fast technique for creating a constant or some sort of connection and that doesn't work until we've got it connected to something else. Now at this point we also see a, a error showing up due to a type conflict. And this will actually be easier to resolve once we have the appropriate inputs connected up to the cluster. Now if you studied those error messages you also notice that it was looking for an array of clusters. So I will use a for loop as a convenient way of generating a series of three value clusters which then combine together into an, an array. Since I'm using auto indexing on the for loop, that's what is actually creating the array of clusters. So as I say, the type mismatch can be resolved once the cluster actually has something to bundle together. I will use zero phase for all of the sinusoids. I'll use a unit value for the amplitude for all of the sinusoids. And then I need to specify F0 times 1, that would be the fundamental frequency, and then F0 times 2, and so on. So as we loop through the for loop, we can multiply the index by the fundamental frequency F0. The index, however, starts at 0, so let me add 1 to the loop index first before applying that to the multiplier.
And then we have a series then of our uh, sinusoids at F naught, twice F naught, three F naught, and so on. Notice that the data type conflict has now been resolved since we have all three inputs operational on the cluster. Also to make this a little bit more general purpose, I'm going to convert the amplitude to a front panel control. And that should be a value between 0 and 1. Now ultimately I need to have the array produced by tones and noise turned into the waveform data type. I'll go ahead and take care of that now. Forming the reciprocal of the sampling frequency gives us the sampling interval dt. And at this point we have a waveform suitable for display. And what I'm hunting for here is triple display. When triple display is given a, a waveform, then the time axis is automatically calibrated correctly. So I configure triple display as an indicator. Connect that to our waveform. Let's try that again. In order to see something, we actually need to have some non-zero values on the front panel controls. All right, these are some suitable values. Since n is zero, then we have no sinusoids. We need at least one. And there it is, right at one kilohertz. Two kilohertz. Well, something's a little odd when you think about it because I had specified 100 hertz back here. We seem to be off by a factor of 10. Aha, here it is. Tones and noise needs the sampling frequency in hertz. Okay, that's good. Now we see that the front panel control is able to properly generate the frequencies we need. I'm going to zoom in on a portion of our graph so we can actually see the sinusoids a little better. Again, a pure sinusoidal tone. What I've done actually is changed my duration to a considerably shorter value, so that way we can just see a few periods at a time. So you'll notice as, as you continue to add additional higher frequency sinusoidal components, the waveform starts to get a little bit more spiky looking, so to speak, but yet it still is always maintaining its uh, somewhat rounded appearance. And that's always a characteristic of any signal that's band limited. Sharp corners, or things like a square wave and so on, these would always be associated with something that produces uh, theoretically an infinite number of, of harmonics. Now one of the issues of or anytime you add multiple sinusoidal harmonics together is the fact that the amplitude of the result is generally greater than one. And I've inserted quick scale in here as a technique for ensuring that the amplitude is always one no matter how many sinusoidal components we've picked.
All right, let me turn off auto scaling on the spectrum plot. And notice now, due to the scaling, that as you add additional sinusoidal components, the amplitude of each component keeps dropping off. You can almost think of that as like a conservation of energy concept where as we add more uh, spectral energy, we have to reduce the overall amplitude of each component. That way the, the end result is always at the same amplitude. All right, let's take a listen to this using the Play Waveform Express VI. And we're done.